right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please, come on, give me a little bit of something. <laughs> Hi, I'm John Lambert, Corporate Vice President and Security Fellow at Microsoft, and today I am joined by... Sherry DeGrippo, uh, Director of Threat Intelligence Strategy at Microsoft. Um, all right, well, normally in security presentations, you get your choice. Do you want doom or do you want gloom? But today, today is nothing like that. From where we sit, uh, we see defenders innovating, evicting attackers earlier and earlier and working together. What we thought we would do here is tell you some stories from the last year in the world of attack and defense. And with that, I think Sherrod's gonna kick us off here with a tour through some of the headlines. Thanks, John. So for those of you who read the news every day, you've probably seen some evidence of that gloom and doom <laughs> that John talked about. We have seen threat actors emerging with lots of new tactics, lots of new ways to attack organizations and people. As an example, did anyone hear about the casino ransomware attacks over the summer? Heard about those? We attribute those to a threat actor we call Octo Tempest, which leverages social engineering to get inside networks and very, very, very quickly ransom those organizations. We also track a threat actor that John will talk about a little bit later, called Volt Typhoon, which is a China-based threat actor that goes after US-based interests, but in Guam. We also have seen an actor that steals cryptocurrency. Has anyone played with cryptocurrency at all? That is heavily integrated into the cybercrime landscape, but we track an actor called Jade, Jade Slee out of North Korea that's stolen over a billion dollars worth of cryptocurrency. And when you think of what that means into that ecosystem and into North Korea, you can see the potential for some really concerning cyber activity on the threat landscape. So the dwell time has gotten shorter, attacks have changed and become more and more, and so how are we responding to that? Microsoft has to step up and make sure that the threat landscape is always being attended to because it changes every single day. So out of those headlines, John, what are you seeing? Well, um, there's certainly more attacks and the attack chains are getting more complex than ever. Uh, the speed that defenders have to respond is, the tempo is faster than ever. Uh, and they certainly have no shortage of alerts to chase. I kind of think in cyber, like every day of the week could be Monday. You just don't know. Um, but at the same time, like a year ago, if I look back, a year ago, I was running the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center. And so my day was Ukraine war, in exchange zero day, solar winds. Uh, and then about a year ago, I switched to in addition to running the Threat Intelligence Center, being responsible for all the security researchers behind the Microsoft security products. So think the Defender Suite, Sentinel, Azure, and together we're working on harnessing all the signal that we can to go defend customers. I took with that role a mission to bring threat intelligence and integrate it deeply in, into the heart of all the products and bring that adversarial mindset uh, and, and bring that mission. And so, um, we purchased this company called Risk IQ. They had great rich data sets and open source intelligence, and we integrated the Microsoft Threat Intelligence into that, and that's Microsoft Defender Threat Intelligence. And we integrated it into the heart of the Defender Suite, into the XDR, so that context is immediately available to defenders. It also has APIs, so you can integrate it into the SOC and wire it into flows with your seam and so on. And then we revisited our threat actor naming taxonomy. A lot of us were, I would say, quite attached to the old way we used to call things, the nobeliums and the strontiums, but it had sort of outlived its usefulness. Um, and you'll see in the next couple of slides, like there's just so many more threat actors. And I don't know if you remember from high school chemistry how many elements there are in the periodic table, but I think it's like 118. Uh, we're way beyond that uh, today. and so. Customers told us they wanted, one, to be able to more easily search for the threat actors uh, that we're talking about. One of our threat actors used to be called Zinc. Uh, if you search for Zinc on the internet, you might find Sunscreen. That's a North Korean actor. Uh, they also wanted more immediate context with the threat actor names. And so now we have a suffix where it's Blizzard for Russia and Typhoon for China-based actors and so on. Uh, and then they also wanted hey, look, you call them this, but we know other people call them that, or we use other tools from other vendors and they use different names. And so we provide AKAs for all the threat actors, not only available online, but also uh, through APIs where you can, you can access all of them and your, your preferred way of, of looking at them. 
Um, and then with Security Copilot, last summer, uh, Charlie Bell, who's our executive vice president, went to Bill Gates' house with the other senior leaders at Microsoft, and they got a preview of new AI technology um, that later the world came to know as GPT-4. And I remember they were like, okay, we're gonna, AI's been around, you kind of go like, is it the year of AI? Well, we feel like we did the year of AI 10 years ago at RSA, and so there was something clearly different about this. I remember Sacha asked the AI something like, can you write an example of, of a note that you'd write to a parent who's caring for a sick child? And it's like, let's see how this thing does on that. And I remember being quite impressed by what got produced. I think Bill asked a question from like the AP bio exam, because uh, that's kind of his thing. And so Charlie came to us uh, after that and was like, look, there's, there's something really different happening here, and we need to go embed that into the heart of all the security products, and that became Security Copilot. And then we talked about speed. So defenders don't just need more alerts. They need the tools to actually intervene and stop attacks, but with pinpoint accuracy. Because in the area of ransomware, like maybe the actor gets in your network and lurks for a while, and then it gets handed off to some actor who's going to ransom it, and then it happens super quickly, like Sherrod talked about. And so automatic attack disruption is one of those things. And then a favorite one of mine, attack path analysis, and I'll say more about that in a little bit. So one of the things that myself and John and these teams all work on are all of the signals that are coming into Microsoft. We obviously need all that signal, but we have a unique visibility where we're getting things in that you don't really see elsewhere in the world. It's an incredibly unique data set. The phrase I always use is kind of looking for a needle in a needle stack. We need to determine which of those signals are benign, which of those signals are malicious, and which ones we need to go act upon. Once we act upon those signals, we can see which ones trigger alerts, which ones trigger detections, and we can build intelligence off of that so that signal becomes detection, becomes intelligence, which then helps us parse more signal. This is on a massive, massive scale with great visibility into the threat landscape. We're blocking threats, but we're looking at everything that we block to tell you what that was, what it did, where it came from, put attribution on it so that it has a threat actor name attached. We also have lots of humans. So I started at Microsoft after 19 years in security. I came to Microsoft earlier this year, and I found incredible talent, which I know I would find, but they have talent that overlaps and interconnects. So malware reverse engineers work with geopolitical analysts. Pen testers work with linguistics experts. People sit together with these overlapping skills and they have access all the time to the expertise from their coworkers that they need. As an example, last week I was in DC for CyberWarCon. Does anyone hear about CyberWarCon? It's an APT conference. Um, check that out, it's fantastic. We had eight presenters on stage in a one-day conference with one track. So we had a lot to say about APT. These experts are constantly building intelligence and working together to make sure that we not only put out great intelligence into our products and detections, but we do the work that we need to do within the security and intelligence community. We are very much focused on those partners and friends um, who we talk to on sharing groups and intelligence groups. So we're presenting at these conferences a lot of work that we've vetted through our partners and friends in the community. I knew the threat intelligence community was important, but when I came to Microsoft, I saw how integrated it was into the work day of threat analysts, intelligence analysts, and all of those people that are doing threat intelligence day in, day out. So let's talk about the other people the threat actors. Is anyone in here a threat actor? <laughs> if you are, I would like to ask you to please leave now. <laughs> this is a threat actor free zone. <laughs> so we do track big groups of threat actors. And the reason we do that, and we focus on that threat actor centric approach is that, has anyone heard the phrase attribution is hard? That's one of the biggest understatements you'll ever hear. Saying who's responsible for a threat is really, really hard. And the reason that we take on that difficult challenge is because we want to know what those threat actors are going to do next. And we want to understand the tools, capabilities, and potential motivations that that threat actor group might have for each of their campaigns or attacks. 
So we track, obviously, nation state. Does everyone know what nation state is? Usually referred to as APT. So those are threat actor groups that uh, are sponsored by a country or nation that usually engage in espionage and sometimes, of course, engage in disruptive activity. We also track financially motivated, which is my favorite. I love a crime where. Does uh, anyone have a preference? Who loves crime where best? I love crime where best. Who loves APT best, nation state best? Look, all of you who aren't picking sides, you're gonna have to pick sides eventually. So start doing your research. So those are two of the big pillars. We also track groups in development. If you've ever seen an attribution to STORM in one of our intelligence blogs, STORMs are those groups that are still in development that were not quite ready to have super high confidence in who they are yet, but we're ready to track them as an emerging group. We've also got private sector offensive actors. Now those are your NSO groups or actors that are sort of professionalized, off to the side, corporate-ish that are leveraged by nation state and sometimes crimeware, but primarily nation state to get things done. So you can kind of think of them as an economy that is leveraged by those nation state actors and we track them differently because they work with so many different nations and groups. We also track influence operation groups and those are important for several reasons. First, over the last few years, we've seen more and more of a convergence of aligned influence operations and disinformation campaigns with actual activity on the threat landscape digitally. And that's something to really be concerned about because it shows that these threat actors, especially from that nation state capability, are combining their operations and combining their projects to have bigger and bigger impact, not just on the threat landscape, but on the global cultural landscape. Over a billion people in 2024 are going to polls. And that's why influence operations are so important. We see them change the landscape and change the culture. So John, tell us why threat intelligence is so important. I was, Sharon and I were talking to some people the other day and I was like, we're raising the bar on the attackers and trying to make their attacks more difficult. And she's like, you're basically trying to make people bad at their job. Heck yeah. And I was like, yeah, I think we're trying to make people bad at their job. But like I said, I took um, a mission to bring threat intelligence into the heart of the security products at Microsoft. And um, when I started at Microsoft 23 years ago, we were very much focused on Microsoft technology, Windows, et cetera. And today it is a heterogeneous world and the security products embrace this heterogeneous world. And so the products are multi-platform, multi-cloud, uh, multi-identity systems, uh, and we're working to make sure we have intelligence across all of them. And then with that, I thought I would start to talk about some of the, some of the stories in cyber this year that sort of stood out to me, and then we can have a couple that stood out to you. I know you love Volt Typhoon, it's one of your faves. Well, here's the thing. Uh, so Volt Typhoon is a threat actor based in China. And over, well over the last year, they had a campaign targeting US critical infrastructure uh, and also interests in Guam. And so one of the things that is interesting about Volt Typhoon is if you wanna make a threat intel person sort of like put down their coffee and pay attention to you, when you're talking about who a threat actor is targeting, you just have to say these three words. And the three words are, no intelligence value. And what I mean by that, like we all understand that APTs target organizations because they have data. That's what cyber espionage is. They need to get into the hack and they get the emails, the documents, the blueprints, the plans, the, the secret source code, all of that stuff. But what about when a target doesn't really have any data? And that's what we saw on some of the targeting of Volt Typhoon. They targeted a water company a water treatment facility in the United States, and you're like, these people don't really have any data. They just have operations. Uh, also, maritime facilities and transportation organizations. And so, when we see targets that have no intelligence value, they only have disruption value, that really makes an intelligence person kind of stand back and go, what is this all about? Because the concern, of course, that it's all pre-positioning and networks for the potential for disruptive attacks. And we've seen that by other groups around the world. Um, so that's uh, Volt Typhoon in a nutshell. Now let me tell you a little bit about um, how Volt Typhoon did their operations. Um, so one thing if you, in the world of Intel that you love 
if, if a threat actor uses it, is custom malware. Like when a threat actor has some really complex uh, malware that they built, modular, et cetera, custom crypto, you name it, like a reverse engineer is, is in heaven. Uh, and a, th and a, a threat intel specialist is in heaven, partially because you got something new and great to analyze, but also it makes the problem of finding them a lot easier because you look for that. And it makes the problem of attributing attacks simpler where you can see, uh, you're like, hey, that's known to this group. Let me check some other things and see if we can really do that. Volt Typhoon does not do that. They use the most generic possible techniques. And so every threat actor has infrastructure they use to launch attacks. And part of how Volt Typhoon builds their covert network where they're gonna come from when they attack an organization is they don't rent VMs or compromise uh, you know, servers somewhere. What they do is they assemble a covert network built from small office, home office routers. Like if you go into a retail store, a coffee shop, a dentist office, you see that thing in the corner with the blinking light, that router, like, it's got an OS on there, it's, got, it's had vulnerabilities, you think they patched it, never. You know? And they have a program where they just find all of these endpoints around the world and then put their implants on them and that's part of their covert network infrastructure, which makes attribution of them very hard because they seem to come out of nowhere from a victim perspective. And also if they need, if they're attacking an organization say in California, they can find a hot point in California to be able to egress from to mount that attack. So from a, from a like, hey, give us all the IPs of the bad guy and we'll block them, that doesn't work with Volt Typhoon. The second thing is they love for penetration, they love to target network devices on the edge. So think VPN appliances, proxies, firewalls, these devices that are by design exposed and on the attack surface. Um, and these network devices, of course, underneath the covers, security controls, um, they're just other kinds of systems, right? They, they run operating systems, they need to be patched. And if you don't patch them, and if you look at the landscape of network appliances, you'll see many vulnerabilities have been found in them in the last few years. Well, Volt Typhoon specializes in that, and they'll use vulnerabilities in a VPN appliance and use that on an unpatched device to get on there. Now, every organization is gonna collect logs from these network devices, and they're gonna flow them to their seam, but they often don't get logs from what's happening inside the device. And that's where they're putting their implant and staying resident. And if you think these network devices like VPN appliances, they're a perfect piggy bank of credentials because people are authenticating to them. And that's how they're, so this is a major way that they use to enter networks that is hard for defenders to know what's going on with them. And then once they begin their process of compromising endpoints and lateral movement, they use these living off the land techniques where they don't need to bring custom malware tools like Mimikatz or other, other foreign executables. They just use the natural administration capabilities in Active Directory or on computers in order to do these attacks. And this is kind of why I say sometimes attackers, they're, they're like IT with different goals. And so that's a bit about how a Volt Typhoon likes to operate. So that is how they get stealth. You wouldn't say this is some crazy, sophisticated dodge and packets left and right, matrix level stuff. It just blends in. Um, so that's Volt Typhoon. Now, that's one example of a threat actor. Um, as Sherrod mentioned, we, we track this over 300 track groups, many more in development in these storm groups, probably hundreds of TTPs across them. But one of the things that's in common with all these threat actors is how they think about compromising and moving around and pivoting inside of a victim network. And that is um, they think about a network that they're in as a set of connected nodes and edges. And so I say attackers think in graphs. Defenders tend to think in lists. And as long as that's the case, attackers are gonna win. And so as an example, an attacker, when they wanna enter your network, they might do some spear phishing, find something on the edge with an unpatched vulnerability, and then they land on that system. They're immediately gonna dump credentials and go, what credentials do I have and where can I get with those? Those are the edges. Those take them the ability to log on and access new systems. And they begin that process of gathering credentials and pivoting as they go. If they have a zero day, that's like they can create new edges in the graph that didn't exist before, that, that IT doesn't know about. And so this is how attackers tend to think in graphs. Now defenders, 
Um, defenders need to think like this, but we're, they're often in the world of having to think about lists of assets. Like I have my endpoint network and I have my servers. Got my domain controllers and I got my databases. Got production or tests. And so they tend to think about how the network is divided up and lists of things that are in there, but they're really all connected by credentials and vulnerabilities and relationships of control and so forth. And so it's really important for defenders to see and think about the network just like attackers do with graphs. And so one of the capabilities that I'm really proud about this year uh, is attack path analysis. And so we took Microsoft Defender for Cloud and somebody that's in defense, you know, they may be familiar with the traditional on-premises world, but the cloud world has, it's got virtual machines, it's got functions, it's got managed identities. There's a lot more componentry in the serverless world of the cloud. And you go, well, how is all this connected? What does an attack graph look like in that world? Well, attack path analysis understands all of the componentry that's in the cloud across Azure, Amazon, and other clouds, and it can build the relationships of control that exist between these things. Because when an alert happens on something somewhere, how do you know that's gonna lead to a boom? How do you know where the attacker can go and might go with that access that they got on something that may look far away from something critical? This is the speed we're trying to give defenders to connect those dots for them and then present all of that with why are these things connected and what is the potential blast rate of those, of those things. So this attack path analysis is one of the innovations I'm really happy that we're bringing from the world of attack to the world of uh, defenders. Speaking of graphs. See that graph, that's a good one up there. Um, so I think something that John, you mentioned that really struck with me, stuck with me and with Volt Typhoon in specific, those edge devices, routers, is everyone updating their home routers? When's the last time you put a patch on your home router? When's the last time your mom or dad put, ooh, maybe go visit over the holidays and update their hardware for them? So I love crimeware. It's one of the threat landscape activities that I love to track the most just because I find it incredibly wild. So if you like to read some of those FBI indictments of ransomware groups, you're with me. I, I wait for them to come out, you know, when they're ready. So let's talk about ransomware. Ransomware has really become as a service. It's broken up into multiple threat actor groups that all have different sort of focuses and capabilities. And I was talking to John and he said, you know, when you're dealing with ransomware, you're not really up against a person. You're not up against a group of people. You're up against a whole economy. And that economy is made up of these different groups of capabilities. Some might do initial access brokers. This is um, a chain for Bumblebee, which is um, a little downloader that's modular. It gets in there and that gives the threat actor backdoor capability. Now, what if I'm a threat actor, I'm a threat actor group, you know, group of friends, and I only do these initial access downloaders. That's all I do. Well, now I've got access to all these networks and I think, you know, I don't want to learn how to do ransomware and I certainly don't want to try negotiating with these organizations once they're under ransom. That's not for me. I'm an introvert. I just want to get access and <laughs> not talk to anybody about it. Well, what they do now is they say, hey, I've worked hard. I've built this backdoor. I've got everybody in here. I've, I've got this list of organizations that I know have backdoors in them. I'm just going to start selling this access. And I don't know who I'm selling it to and I don't know what they're gonna do with it. I'm just kinda look the other way, hope for the best. I got paid. And so that really is kind of how that economy works. They're operationalized, they're professionalized, and they're focused typically on one particular type of activity, and they just kinda do that. And what that does, right, if I say, I've got access to some organization, I did a little recon, but I don't really know much about them. I've got this list. I'm going to sell them to whoever. I don't know who I'm selling it to. It's you know kind of a underground sort of thing. That gives me a step away from it, and it cuts up our ability to do attribution and to track them. So what we've had to do with ransomware as a service is track the initial access brokers, track the ones that traffic in credentials, track people selling different things. And we've had to assign threat actor groups to these very specialized smaller capabilities like Storm 1101 here that you see 
they're selling an attacker in the middle fish kit. And what I find so fascinating on this side of the, the economy is they treat it, number one, customer service is the top. They are focused on making their customers happy. They've got customer service skills. I used to work in the mall. You used to work at a movie theater, our teen jobs. And the customer is always right, apparently, when you're doing these criminal activities. But you can see here that they're upgrading licenses. They have VIP licensing. And they went from $100 to $300 because it looks like they were hitting some bad macroeconomic headwinds. So, they're, they're focused on their services. And something always to think to keep in mind, in my opinion, about um, the crime economy is that usually these threat actor groups don't really think they're doing anything wrong. And a lot of times they get tracked by us, but they don't necessarily get picked up and put away most of the time. So what that means is we have to focus on stopping these attacks automatically. John talked a little bit about dwell time. We've seen those dwell times go shorter and shorter, meaning that threat actors are in the network, and that time to detect, that time to respond, is shorter all the time before an organization becomes under ransom. In this particular example, let's talk about those credentials that are sold. In this particular example, the actor was able to use those compromised credentials to get into an unenrolled device. And those devices are super, super dangerous because they have lots of capability under the radar. If they're not enrolled, you might not really see what's going on there. But when they started moving around, and that's what these threat actors do, especially in the crime world, they love to pivot. They love to get in and start exploring the graph that John just talked about. So once they're in there, they're messing around. With automatic attack disruption, what we can see is even with this unenrolled device, the other devices that were enrolled said, hey, you can't sit with us. They isolated that machine. Even though it wasn't enrolled, they were able to give it bad reputation so that it didn't allow that machine to start interacting further down the chain. And this threat actor was not able to do ransom automatically. And I think that's what's important that we've talked about is the capability has to happen so fast, and it has to happen in a guided, automatic way because threat actors are going really quickly. So this is sort of talking about that attack disruption capability. And you can see, if you're smart, you notice there's a little bit of a graph there. And that kind of shows what has actually happened with those attack disruptions. Has anyone come from a detection engineering background? Raise your hand if you've written a SIG. Somebody in here has written some SIGs some, at some point, right? You've written some rules, some SIGs. Oh, jeez, <laughs> get out. So yeah, if you're a detection engineer, you know how good it feels to write just the right signature that triggers on just the right network activity, just the right PCAP, just the right processes being spawned. It's so beautiful and perfect. And then when you're in the SOC, well, we've been breached. All these, all these alerts, they, they triggered on the activity, but they didn't stop it. That's what we're trying to solve here, is we want the detection to stop the activity for you automatically in XDR, level, or excuse me, leveraging the machine learning and AI capability that has it done for you. So let's talk about Security Copilot. Yesterday we got a lot of Security Copilot in the keynote, and what I find fascinating about Security Copilot is that I know a lot of people, do you know anyone who's like, I wanna be a better reverse engineer? Everyone wants to do reverse engineering. They want to get samples and they want to understand what they do. And what I love about Security Copilot is it can do some of that skilling for you. It can guide you through incidents. It can help you write your reporting, but it can make you a better analyst. It can make you a better researcher. It can give you skills and sit next to you in ways that you've never really had before unless you had a human person who was already an expert that would sit there and explain it to you. And sometimes that's not always an option, especially for organizations that don't have a big built out threat intelligence team or a big built out reverse engineering team. This kind of gives you a fractional reverse engineer, a fractional intelligence analyst that a SOC person can sit with and upskill themselves. The other thing that I really love about Security Copilot is that it makes SOC analysts, especially if they're new in career, 44% more accurate and 26% faster, meaning 
that they can do their jobs to protect their organization more efficiently and more quickly because they have Security Copilot as their buddy. So one of the things uh, that I also like to highlight is in the world of defense, you have to defend the technology, the assets that a customer has, but you also need to defend the defenders. Uh, every set of IT security, SOC, I mean, this job just doesn't stop, it feels like. And so you need capacity, you need to give them downtime, they need to be able to have nights, weekends, you know, holidays, they need to be able to renew themselves and restore, because it cannot, like a crisis starts and you don't know when it's going to end. And so one of the things that we also have that's in my team is the Microsoft Defender experts. And these are an operational managed service capability that is there that is connected to all the world of threat intelligence that we just talked about today that are there to augment and supplement a SOC team. And if you just need them to do hunting and understand from their understanding of the latest happening uh, in the ecosystem and bring that to over hunting and things like that, they can do that. If you also want them to take uh, defensive action, actually stop, attracts, stop attacks in their tracks, maybe stop credentials from being used and whatnot and do some targeted interventions, they can also do that as well. So it's just, it's one of those things where integrated into the heart of our threat intelligence work. We have these experts there. And I always felt like in the world of security, you want as little distance as possible between what we're doing and attacks happening to customer, which is why we've always had this mindset of like, go understand the threats, go work with customers on those threats, study the adversaries and so on. And this Microsoft security experts and defender experts are part of how we do that directly. Um, and then I thought Jared could take you through um, so a couple of things about how to find out more from us. Yes, I would love for you to find out more. Please raise your hand if you are a defender. Everyone in this room should be raising their hand. You're all defenders. You all have a responsibility for security at your organizations, or at least for your family when you go home at Thanksgiving. Um, we want to arm defenders. We want you to feel like you are skilled up, like you are ready, like you have things at your fingertips that you can use to protect yourself and your organizations better, faster, more efficiently, and in some cases, make it a little fun. So we have the Microsoft Threat Intelligence blog, which is a fantastic resource that you can just go check out anytime you want. Uh, those blogs come from a variety of teams that do threat intelligence across Microsoft, not just Microsoft threat intelligence community, but also the detection and response, incident response capability. We combine with them so that we get a full picture in our intelligence blogs of what the attacks look like, meaning we're tracking that threat actor, and as we see that threat actor, for whatever reason, be successful, the incident response team that responds to that incident we have that full picture with both teams often in those threat intelligence blogs. And they include IOCs. That is a big part of making sure that those blogs are ready to go. They've got IOCs in the bottom of it for you. So that's a threat intelligence blog. And then we also have the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Podcast hosted by me. I would love for all of you to check that out because a couple of things that you should know. First, remember a second ago when, well, it's been a couple minutes now. Remember earlier when I said, Casino attacks. Does everyone remember that, the casino attacks? We have a full hour episode of incident responders who have responded on the ground to those attacks, telling you what it looks like and what that threat actor is doing. We also have a rundown capability of Peach Sandstorm, which is an Iranian-based threat actor that's been very active lately. You can listen to that on your commute. When you get to work, by the time you're done, unless you work from home, um, if you drive in a car on your commute, um, then by the time you get to work, you'll have kind of a new perspective on threat intelligence that's upskilled you to get you where you want to be. And it's pretty fun to listen to, I think. You've listened to it. It's okay. I have. And <laughs> you can hear what it's like to do threat intel. And like one of the questions I love to ask people in security, and if you're not in security, but you work with people in security, if they're new, ask them why they joined. Like, what made you take this job? And if they've been there a while, ask them what, why did they stay in security? I think you'll find some interesting answers from your colleagues. Like, the way I got into security was a little inauspicious, which was I, I got a computer science degree, went to work at IBM, 
right out of college as the new person, you don't get to pick what you're working on. You get what's left over. What was left over? <laughs> Wait, no one else. Secu security was left over. <laughs> but I fell in love with it, attack, defense, the creativity, like they pay you to, to think about the world in an adversarial way. And that is just a really fascinating way to, to look at the world. And I stuck with it and you can hear some of those folks, not just you know the latest uh, threat, but also what it's like to do a threat intelligence job at the podcast. Yeah, there's some good detection engineering if you're interested in that. There's uh, really great detection engineers that come on and talk about like, how do they know when a regex is right? When do they want to use Yara? When do they want to use network detection? And it's really interesting to, to hear some of those people's stories. So those are both things that you can access now today that I hope you will. And then Microsoft Defender Threat Intelligence is also available. And this is a one-stop portal that has all of your threat actor information, which John mentioned earlier when we did the threat actor renaming, one of the things that John himself said was absolutely required was a downloadable Excel spreadsheet and JSON format. And I use that Excel spreadsheet every single day. So if anyone ever says, oh, well, Microsoft calls it this and they call it this, and we have that for you. You can just download it off of the blog, spreadsheet and JSON, so you can incorporate that into your daily life. I keep the spreadsheet open all day pretty much. Um, and so Microsoft Defender Threat Intelligence as a full portal is available now. And John, how can they get that? Uh, it's built into the XDR, because that would make sense to do. It's available standalone if you don't use the Defender Suite. It's there as well. And we have this thing called Copilot. And you go, would that thing be smarter with threat intelligence? It would, so there's a license built into the early access Copilot that has all of the threat intelligence in there as well. So you can see we're spreading the love around. It's everywhere. It's, it's spread around like peanut butter. You can get it. All right. Well, I hope you've uh, enjoyed hearing from us today as we kind of narrated some of the, the takeaways in the world of attack defense. Uh, we'll go ahead and take some questions I think we have coming in here in the time remaining. But it's been, we'll be available afterwards. You can chase me down. Please run up and say hi. Um, it's nice to get a break from all the threat actors for a second, so. And if you are a threat actor, please leave. Oh yeah, no, give business card and yeah. Yeah, yeah give me your contact info and then please leave. <laughs>